Welcome to round three of the 1966 Formula One World Championship here in northeastern France at the legendary public road circuit named for the city nearby, Reims. Of course, for the French Grand Prix. Just two weeks off the endurance run at Le Mans, the Formula One Championship is back underway in earnest in what is easily the highest speed event of the season. This is the third points paying round of the 66 F1 Championship in part 24 my 1966 series where I take on the role of Richie Axelson and race through a full season as they did back then, driving anything and everything and everywhere possible. Last time out with Formula One, it was for the Belgian Grand Prix at the soggy spa Francorchamps, a fast, terrifying race ending in tears after contact with Jochen Rent in the late stages, luckily escaping without major injury but ruining our brand new Eagle chassis and a shot for some decent points. Coming off the Belgian Grand Prix and Le Mans, the Formula One community has initiated a game of musical chairs. John Surtees set off the first domino with his public resignation from Ferrari over a driving dispute at Le Mans. The motorcycle champion seemed a likely candidate for world driver's honors, but his sudden departure has created a much different grid than we saw last time out. But Surtees has found a suitable home with the Cooper Works team, taking over alongside Rent for our sports car teammate Richie Ginther, who has departed with his eyes set on the Honda F1 team, who is set to make their first start of 66 later in the season. In a surprising move as well, joining Surtees and Rent at Cooper to drive a third factory car is a young Chris Amon from New Zealand. All three drivers in the latest T81 with V12 Maserati engines are clearly showing Cooper's determination to come out on top in this return to power season. In Surtees' place at Ferrari, Bandini has been promoted to number one, joined now in a second full 3.0-liter V12 by factory sports car and F1 reserve Mike Parks. The two fully powered Scarlet machines are on the grid for the first time this season for a race which should truly highlight which team has found the power. And a challenge to the power as well, Jack Brabham and his venerable Repco V8. Leading the points championship after the two opening rounds, Jack will be joined alongside by his teammate, Denny Holm, finally having the chance in an equal Repco machine. During the real event, it was Jack Brabham and his Repco V8 dueling with Bandini from the start. Although the Ferrari may have a slight power advantage and in the initial laps put a gap on Brabham, in the baking sun on a hot Sunday afternoon it was the reliability of the Brabham's Repco engine which pushed him along. Finally, after 32 laps of the circuit, Bandini's Ferrari came to a halt with a snapped throttle cable. And although it was a relatively quick fix, it gave Brabham just enough to pass the stricken Ferrari and build up a sizable lead. Brabham came to the line 40 seconds ahead of Parks to win the French Grand Prix, the first ever winner of a Grand Prix in a car which bore the same name, and the first win for Jack since 1960. Rounding out the podium was his teammate Holm, a distant two laps down, but it was clear the Brabham team and all of their preparations in the early season had turned them into the favorites to win. And so in our edition, Richie comes to France off his second place at Le Mans, hoping to do just one better. But our major accident at Spa has left us without a ride. The Gurney Anglo-American team had just been able to prepare us an Eagle chassis for Belgium, which we promptly destroyed. And with much of the racing world having focused on Le Mans, it was not possible to prepare a second in time for Reims. So Gurney has given Richie the go-ahead to seek out an alternate ride just for this one. Still tied for third in points, it would be tough to miss it. And while it's not ideal to jump in a random car, the highways at Reims demand a high-powered engine anyway. Something the Anglo-American team is promising will come later in the season, but Gurney is still sat in front of the diminutive board out climax for the time being. In the lead up, it was clear Cooper would be fielding a third car, but after the incident at Spa, that door had firmly been closed and Chris Amon came in to take the ride. The Lotus Group has also been hard at work and seemed an interesting prospect, but Chapman and his team are still wrestling to come to grips with the H16 and only had a low powered 2 liter Climax sat in a year old chassis to offer. As almost insult to injury for Lotus, in qualifying for the event, Jim Clark would have a run in with a bird striking him in the face and leaving him sidelined for the weekend. A young Mexican Pedro Rodriguez is set to take his place. And so in a last ditch effort, but a promising one at that, a deal has been struck up with British Racing Motors, BRM, to sit alongside Graham Hill in place of Jackie Stewart, who was injured at Spa. In practice for the event, both Hill and myself drove the P86 model with the mammoth H16, but after unsolvable gearbox trouble, Hill has decided once again to return to his venerable 
V8-powered P261, which was so successful in the Tasman Championship. And so for this one, I'll be driving the unproven, unrefined beast that is the H16. Effectively two eight-cylinder engines coupled together. It's extremely fast in a straight line, but its overall weight and complexity are its ultimate downfall. If I'm easy on the gearbox and revs, have a little bit of luck and somehow keep the slipstream through the bends, this could be a very successful race. So taking a quick look at the points, it's all tied up at front between Jack Brabham and John Surtees. One win and one second place apiece. But with Surtees moving to the Cooper team now, it's going to be interesting to see how competitive they really are and if you can actually keep Brabham honest. Back tied for third place, it's myself and Bandini, both with a third place, uh, mine coming at Monaco, his at Spa. So today's race will be telling and help settle some things. This tiebreaker that we have across all of the positions through the top 10 will be unlikely to continue post today. In the Manufacturers Championship, it's much the same story with a tie between Brabham Repco and Ferrari. But with the shakeup at Ferrari, you'll have to see if Bandini and Parks can keep up the pace and try to keep Ferrari competitive. And so we'll take a quick look at the track. Just six turns if you're not familiar with Reims, the classic Grand Prix circuit in use since 1954 through the early 70s and parts of it are still there today, but it's basically a construction or three roads brought together to build quite an awesome fast Grand Prix circuit. The track is all about high speed, but there are a few challenging corners coming down to the first turn, fast sweeper that you need to get the line right it would be hard to go side by side through there and then up the hill into a couple corners which require downshifting and braking especially in the brm not just going to throw the car in there on full fuel the lap itself is punctuated by two hairpins first the moison at the top of the hill and then the thilwa at the bottom of the hill with a long straightaway in between them down a very steep hill and getting up to some very high speeds possibly the highest speeds of the whole season with a track this fast and this simple in construction, it's all about slipstreaming. And so making sure I stay up with the other cars, not losing the lead pack, they can actually drag you along quite well. And I might not be as fast at raw pace as the Brabham or the Ferrari, but if I can stick with them and draft with them, slipstream with them, I might actually have a shot coming to the line. The real life race was run over 48 laps of the five mile circuit. So keeping with the one third distance we've been doing all season, that's just 15 laps for the Grand Prix. Taking a look at the starting grid, it's an eclectic front row. We've got Lorenzo Bandini starting on the pole in his Ferrari, taking over for John Surtees, but alongside the Brabham of Jack Brabham on the front row in the middle, and then Surtees himself, but in the Cooper this time, starting on the outside. Row two is the second Ferrari with Mike Parks and Chris Amon. And looking back to row three, we've got three Coopers all lined up, Rint, Ligier, and Siffert. I'll be starting back on row four, back in the 10th position, but just four rows back, starting on the outside, right next to my teammate for this race, at least, Graham Hill. But he is driving that slower or lower horsepower V8 engine, but possibly more reliable, making it to the end. I'll have a bit more power, hopefully can stick with this lead pack, maybe get around the majority of row three here as we all break away from the line. Further back, quite surprising that Denny Holmes starting back on the fifth row, but on the inside, I have a feeling we'll be hearing from him. And then Dan Gurney in the Climax powered Eagle and the sole remaining Eagle chassis starting back there in the 15th spot. So the 1966 French Grand Prix celebrated the 60th anniversary of Grand Prix racing in France. It was a very big event, a very prestigious event, and one every driver and team wanted to win. So let's get started with this. Round three of the 1966 Formula One World Championship, the French Grand Prix. All right, so here we are on the grid. A lot of cars in front, so we'll try to make some passes, get up to the lead pack. Flag is up. Down, we're underway. Walking down off the line, everybody quite slow. Get up the gears now, Ligier to the inside there, slow. Oh, come on, BRM. There we go, now up the gears, drag race towards turn number one. Very slow off the line, Ligier cuts in front. Lock up the tires there. I think that's Denny Holm behind me from the back row. It's stuck in behind Ligier, basically slamming on the brakes as we come down to turn one. We'll funnel through though now towards turn number two. And spot the entry here. It's a difficult corner in this car. Right at the 100 marker, down two gears into fourth. This is a six speed car as we'll slide our way through. Six gears, so one additional one than usual. We need every bit of those gears to get this beast around the track. Right 
down a fourth long left-hander then set us up for the Hassan hairpin all the way down to first gear nice and easy through want to get a good exit there so the back straight away fastest part on the circuit fastest stretch of road of the whole season Just outside of slipstream distance, I think. Up to sixth gear, then top speed. Really does take some practicing to use all six gears instead of just five. Over the top of the hill, though, and we'll rush down to the Thilwa hairpin, the final turn on the circuit. Just out of slipstreaming range, or close slipstreaming range anyway. We have a good corner here to stick with them. No sign of home behind. We'll spot the 300 marker. Heavy on the brakes. All the way down from six to first. We're gonna slide a little bit wide there. Try to late apex it. Home pulled right back in on me. All right, we'll come through raggedy exit. Manhandle the BRM here to come to complete lap number one. Not a great start. Got really brake checked there from Ligier coming off the line. We see the skid marks here as we come towards turn one, but come over the hump, lift the throttle just a little bit as it gets light, and then hard into turn number one. In the later laps, this will be pretty easy flat, but right now it's quite difficult. Just a lift of the throttle through there, close up a little bit on the cars in front, we'll come to turn number two. It fans out a little bit, trying to spot a line. Ligier's still in front, so I guess that's right. He was able to stay in front of me with that move. Down to fourth gear. Slide it through. It was a little late on the downshift there. I'll slide all the way out to the edge of the track. Just kick up a little bit of dust. Down to first into the Moisson. Just need to be really careful about getting on the power because he'll do that. Kick the rear end down. Just catch the wheel there. Not going to help my straightaway speed either. It's got home right on me again. I just get a slight bit of boost though from the cars in front. A lot of time to think about your braking and turn entry on this track. It's easy to psych yourself out. You to really stick to your braking markers, especially in this car. It feels like you can drive just a bit deeper every time, but this, you'll definitely catch you out after a while. Right there, though, at the 300, all the way down the gears. Oh, a car on the inside hit the dirt. That might have been Ligier again. All right, come around. Last corner, so 13 laps to go. P9, Ligier in front, home behind, just what I thought. Actually closed up on them. That scramble in the final corner. Slightly closer, it'll help the slipstream. I think the BRM here, very slow through the slower corners, but on the straights, might actually be a bit quicker than most of the cars. As long as it holds together. Definitely quicker than I would have been with the Eagle Climax. Blessing in disguise, maybe. No sign of Graham Hill, though. We'll be pretty far back with that V8. All right, come up the hill. It's a little bit quicker through here. Just try to get on the throttle and do some oversteer to it. Right out to the edge of the track. Nice and gently through there. To make sure I get that downshift on turn in. Help slow the car with a bit of engine braking. One fans out up to Moison. Less dramatic this time through here. Still kick it around. If you do it right, it can be pretty quick, but it's hard to do right. Spun the car there a few times in practice. Getting acquainted with it. Right up to fifth gear. Just hanging on to the back of the pack here. It seems like the front group might be breaking away a little bit. Definitely can't get unattached from them. Need to pick up three more spots to get up into the points. Those 
right in front of me, the three. Spot the braking marker here. Still too far back to make any kind of move. Just watch for some fireworks ahead. Lugier once again going to the inside. I'm down to second gear. And then to first as we get in the corner. Siffert now, so Ligier able to get around Siffert. We got Siffert right in front. A bit closer this time, too. Right up to fifth gear. Across the line, the fans see the car streak by for just a second. you'd need the bright colors as we're coming to turn one to lift quite a lot there try to find some kind of apex well Sifford slow on the exit get up the inside of him right. get in front of him swapping after turn one I didn't think that would be a passing zone down a fourth get all kind of crossed up coming in Ligier as well. See the two Ferraris up there. Probably the Jack grab him in the lead. I expect. Right down to first. Oh, catching the rear end of the car. Got a lot of forward brake bias in this car. Locked the tires quite a lot, but the rear end just wants to swap around with that heavy engine. A lot closer this time on the straightaway, though. Might have a bit of a run on Ligier here in front. He's doing quite well so far at his home race. It's not quite tucked up behind the cars in front, too. Should have, should have a good run. I should have a good run here. Dip to the inside. Been a little bit early coming out of the slipstream over the hill. You never know what's going to happen. Dip back in. Come down to the braking zone. He's actually behind the cars in front, so he was able to get a bit of a toe as I dipped out. Come down to the braking zone then, 300. Oh, I just brake so late. Down to first gear. Almost park it on the inside. Siffer right in my mirror too, keeping me honest. Come by to complete another lap. The race is going to go by really quick here. It's the same distance as the other Grand Prix, but on such a fast circuit. It does not take long at all. Up to sixth gear. A little bit of a run now on Ligier coming around the front straight away. Dip to the inside. The car in front as well, looking to the inside, maybe blocking. Down to fifth for turn one. Got around Ligier though, he just gave me the spot. Back up to sixth. Siffert looking at him as well. A little dust kicking up there. All right, so another position. Let's pick them off one by one. If I do that, I might be able to actually make something out of this have to stick with this pack, can't make any mistakes. This definitely will not be one on pace alone. It's a lot like super speedway racing though. It's just all about the slipstream and making moves at the right time. All right, down the gears, down to first. Yeah, I think Brabham there is just breaking away from the two Ferraris, which is very impressive. Repco V8's got a lot of power. Lost a lot of time on the car in front. Not sure who it is at this point. Sixth gear then. They're going to have a heavy toe. I won't. Just looking in my mirrors as well. Try to lift off the throttle just a little bit as I come over the hill. Don't want to over rev the car too much. Mechanical failures are a big issue at a circuit like this with so much fast running. Spot the braking though. You know, it's just one gear, it feels like so much more. Slide a little bit wide there. Siffer to the inside. 10 laps to go. P8, last time through, so P7 now, just one point. The one position out of the points. There's Siffer. Lost him on my mirrors for a second.
try to put in a perfect first part of the lap to keep with these guys. I'm just in the slipstream now, but judging by previous laps from this far back now, not going to be good by the time we get there. Still not able to go flat out through the first corner. end out up the hill nice slide on the entry make that left rear tire work Not too deep there through the left hander but catch the slide dance down the gearbox once again All right not too far off might even be a little bit closer than last lap through, so it's not, hope's not dead yet. Just outside the points, all six of them right in front. Of course, championship leader out front, I think. Not able to break away, though. It'd be really hard to break away at a track like this. Scream down the hill here sure who I'm chasing. Another Cooper, I think. See if I can spot on the pit board this time. Break a little bit later into the final hairpin. Just don't want to push it too far. Car crawls over the circuit as it slows down. Kick the rear end out. So, Eamon. Eamon in front. Chris Eamon, the new Cooper driver. Just in front. Oh, some smoke in front, too. One of the cars broke. That might have been rent there. We'll get around Eamon as well. Oh, that's going to leave me pretty far back from the pack in front. So past two cars there. I saw smoke and a bunch of parts on the racetrack. The Cooper's blowing up though, coming out of the final hairpin. Pretty sure it was rent on the dark green helmet. That's gonna simplify things up front a little bit, so just like that, up into the points, but not barely hanging on really. Aiming behind me now. He was right on rent, so that would have been a big surprise. Mouthful of gearbox or whatever it was. But down through the left hander here. Almost forming a second pack though. Run a bit deep into the hairpin, slide it in, just catch the car. Half throttle trying to come out of it. The car really just doesn't pick up and then suddenly it hits you almost like a turbo car. So quite far back and I've got a good string of cars behind. I'm not really gonna have much of a slipstream at all this time. to sixth gear. The BRM is quick, but I imagine the Cooper in the slipstream is going to be pretty quick as well. It's hanging on right behind me. I think it's still aiming there. So looking in the mirror, trying to spot the marker in front. There we go. Heavy on the brakes. Down to first gear. Slide it in. in front kicking up some dust it's p5 i think might be a lap delayed certes though in front it's the other cooper already seen one explode so you never know what's going to happen but that's one of the risks of following other cars so closely especially when they're not so mechanically sound you risk a car blowing up right in front of you as you're on their gearbox it does not end well but through the first corner. Try to find the apex. I was able to keep it flat that time, but scrubbed off quite a lot of speed. Need these guys in front to battle with each other, but they're probably content just riding along for now. A lot of laps to go. Half the Grand Prix. Right out to the edge. Down to 
fourth gear. I'm gonna go a little bit of side by side. This is one of the trickiest corners just to get slowed down for and then carry speed. It always feels like you could go a bit quicker. I want to entry a bit enter it a bit wider, but it's really difficult. Got aiming though right on me from behind. Definitely lost the slipstream for the group in front. So unless there's a mechanical failure or a slow car or something, it's gonna be really difficult to catch them. This one might turn into a bit of a mirror defense. Still flat out, got that Cooper closing in behind. And down to the 300 boards, there we go. Aiming looking to the inside. Not quite close enough. I think we still have Holm with us though, so Holm having a really good race thus far. So seven laps to go over halfway. Losing the lead pack. I think if I, if I could get back to them somehow, it could possibly be quick enough. Never know what's going to happen. Half the race to go. I hope for mechanical failures of some kind. Hopefully not with my own car. Throw it into turn one. I've got a good little string of cars behind me. All the way back to Ligier, it looks like. But you can just hear the RPM so much lower when you're not following another car. Nice and tidy though, just try to do my best to keep this position at least. It's a couple points, it's not gonna get me anything in the championship. I think both Surtees and Brabham are up front there. But you never know what's gonna happen as we go on through the season. Right out to the edge. the car through a tight corner there noise on hairpin all of this track is basic just six corners and long straightaways I think they do keep it interesting specifically in a car like this and I don't want to use the car as a crutch it's definitely a tricky car to drive around this track but definitely keeps you working the long straightaways like I said you can really just overthink your braking zones, your braking markers, gives you a lot of time. For a full Grand Prix, it's both relaxing as well as more difficult with all the slipstreaming. See them side by side in front though. All right, come down. Even really hasn't made too much of a challenge yet. Really quickly through the gears there, just wanna keep that engine braking going. See him on the exit there. This race in 1966 was especially punishing on the cars because of the heat. And it's likely that Bandini would have actually won the real one had his throttle cable not broke. It's really nothing related to the engine itself kind of a, an error or a failure that could happen on, on any car, really. But you do have to get to the finish line first to win. Doesn't matter how it happens. Fourth gear there, it's a lot of skid marks on the track, I think. I'm scuffling early on. Maybe some incidents out back have been seen. The fourth into the left-hander. Oh, just missed second gear there. Kick it into first. Rear end wants to come around. You need to avoid hitting the gearbox like that. It's a very fragile gearbox. It's the main issue the BRM team have with this car. Able to hold on to it though. It's both bad for the gearbox, but also makes making the corner quite difficult. Right up to sixth. Not 
sure the race is quite long enough to catch any lap traffic unless they run into some issues. I did a first gear. Just trying to keep that braking marker the same. I could possibly go a little bit later with it, but just keeping it safe. All right, five laps to go only. Way off the group in front, unfortunately, but stick with it's at least a couple points for fifth place. Not a bad showing and a one-off drive with a new team. We can make it there. Five more laps, though. Just to watch for Eamon as we get down to it. He might just be saving everything. Have to lift off the throttle just a little bit there. Under steering mid-corner. the car through you can induce a lot of oversteer just by kicking the throttle in mid corner especially in a faster corner like that or this one down a fourth gear get that throttle on to help rotate the car up to fifth just for a second it's probably unnecessary gonna be a bit deep here Ugh. missing it again into the moisson that's gonna lose me three places That's exactly what we didn't want to do, but have the pack still with me here, so should be able to shoot around them once again. Got Siffer here in front. Should get a nice run because I had a bit more speed. Coming through the fast outside line, but he's actually going to have the draft here down the straightaway on the outside. Over the top of the hill, rush down side by side. Denny home right in front now, up into the points. Big error on my part. It should be easily avoided. Come down though to the final hairpin. Down to first gear, everybody side by side, moving back and forth. I think I've got UGA to my left as well. He's getting around. Should be able to slot back in front of Ligier. There we go. All right, so losing a whole bunch of positions. I got to get these back at least. Never get complacent. Really easy to outbreak yourself in this car. And really good run on Sifford here as we'll come down to turn one. Should be easily clear him before the first corner. There we go, slotting behind home. Finally driving one of the Repco V8s. His teammate having the better of a time at it. to turn to home on the outside there a twitch on the entry up to fifth gear long slide through the long left hander onto Moisan again to get this right just went a little too deep maybe didn't get the engine braking correct I've already missed a gear here as well you can see my skid marks running wide I was likely to keep it out of the barriers Kick the car. Definitely difficult driving with the BRM. Doesn't seem to want to co cooperate on the handling, at least how I have it set up. Lost a bit of time to the two in front, but should have a nice slipstream here down the straightaway. Siffert falling off behind just a little bit. And time this right. Maybe can make a lunge into the final hairpin. I see a few more cars up there just out of view. Might be some slower traffic that the leaders are catching. We'll see. Nice run, though, on home. Easily up the inside. Should be side by side, maybe, with Eamon coming into the braking zone. 300 there. Whoa. Missed one of the gears. Missed two of the gears. All right, get it back in gear. Man. Well, the gearbox is going to break. Now's about the time for it to do. Missing two gears down in the downshift. I don't know what's going on. All right. Luckily able to make the corner. Get back in the slipstream. I'd actually be able to make an easy pass here across the line. Get back to where I was. Not on merit. Across the line, though. Slide right in front of Eamon. 
back in a T1. So back where I was, despite the mistakes, no sign of the leaders in front. Should be back in fifth though. Up to turn two. mirrors down a fourth chuck it into this long left hander it's really the only left hander on the circuit there we go properly slowed down for the long right aiming right there though just a little kick of gravel for him We'll come through. I think we're in the final few laps of it. Not a great race so far by any means. Oh, a nice little pack of cars too. I don't know. There's just some lap traffic the leaders are catching. Might make things interesting. You never know. Lap cars should most likely just let them by. We'll come up though to the final hairpin. No fireworks, no yellow flags. Down to first. We'll take a look. Two laps to go, so just two more. A whole bunch of cars in front. I have to imagine those are the slower ones letting the quicker cars by, though. Two strung out way in the lead there. The real Grand Prix, only two cars actually finished on the lead lap. The speed differential in some of the slow cars, too, is quite dramatic, so we'll see what happens here in the closing couple of laps. All right, in the long right-hander into turn one. See three or four cars in front. I don't know, though, if that's any of the cars that I'm looking for. Although it's a lot of cars, and we're closing up quite dramatically, so... Let's just see what happens. I think I have... Taylor, Trevor Taylor in front, one of the F2 drivers. The fourth gear a little bit late. Tell it's the baby blue car. It's only one painted like it in the race. Taylor, Arundel as well in one of the Lotuses. So these are some of the really slow cars. I think just a few up the road though. I can see one of the Coopers. So I did actually gain a lot there, I think. To fifth gear should be able to pick up a bit of a slipstream off some of the slower cars I have to see if I can get around them if they're gonna move for me get to the inside though should be able to just run on by the lot Arundel looks like Pedro Rodriguez there for Jim Clark and Dan Gurney give him a little wave thank you sir race would not have gone well in the Gurney Eagles just such a track that needs high horsepower we'll come down to the hairpin though all right focus forward you can see the two Ferraris there in the Cooper I gained a ton through that whole exchange with the lapped cars but we're gonna come to get the white flag not the white flag but the final lap might be one of the Coopers in front of me here just barely see him to sixth gear if you catch the lap traffic it seems like they caught them in the slow part of the circuit really tough to get by especially when you're all packed up as well broke up the front pack quite a bit too try very best to try to put in a good lap here for the final lap the french grand prix to catch who's ever in front of me if it's even possible come through turn one there to lift just a little bit two gears little power into it get the car to rotate there it's a good example of it the long left hander all right up to Moisson 
not really pulling in at all on the car in front, so I don't think it's going to be possible. Got the Cooper behind too, probably aiming still. Look out for a run behind. I don't think I'm going to catch anybody in front. Just need to put in a solid final hairpin. Nothing dramatic on this lap so far. Right, up to sixth gear. Come over the top of the hill. A few more slow cars in front as well. Things get really interesting with the slower traffic. It's not going to be quite enough to back up the leaders and break up their slipstream enough. Maybe another 10 laps. You never know what could happen. But we'll concentrate here down to the final hairpin. Right past the 300 board. Heavy on the brakes. A bit too heavy, but just taking it nice and cautious. Eamon's just looking to follow through. Finish his first Grand Prix for a works team. And there we go. Come out of the final hairpin. So not... The most exciting French Grand Prix. Not a very cleanly driven one. This car is a beast to handle. But making it to the finish, I think picking up a couple of points. From not having a ride to a couple of points, I'll take that for the French Grand Prix. So across the line to finish the French Grand Prix, a messy race, really hard to handle. It's not the entire excuse, missing the braking zone and running a bit wide, but holding onto the car, not breaking the gearbox somehow, despite a few missed shifts with the six speed. All in all, I think it was a success. So taking a look at the final results, Jack Brabham gets the win to extend his championship lead ahead of Mike Parks finishing second in his first race for Ferrari. And Lorenzo Bandini comes away third, making it two Ferraris on the podium, although not the two steps that they would have wanted. Not too bad for the Scuderia. And then it's John Surtees finishing fourth, coming behind his former teams. That has to hurt somewhat. But picking up fourth for his first run with Cooper, which I'm sure they appreciate as well. And there we are, Richie Axelson in fifth place for BRM. Potentially the only race for BRM. Picking up a couple of points while I'm at it. And then finally in sixth, Chris Amon as well in his first run for Cooper, picking up that all-important point. He didn't make much of a challenge with me, which was surprising, but I think just wanting to get to the end and uh, see that checkered flag is more important than anything. Looking back further, Denny Holm had a decent race, but not, not as good as his teammate, obviously. He had a much worse starting position. I'm not actually sure what happened to him in qualifying, but going forward, I'm sure he'll be one to watch as well. And Guy Ligier, worth a note, finishing an eighth in his home Grand Prix, usually towards the rear of the pack, but with that Maserati engine on such a fast circuit, he was able to do quite well for the home fans. And at the back of the grid, just a few retirements. Yak and Rent we saw there in spectacular fashion, saying a coolant failure, but some sort of explosion with his car. And Joe Bonnier as well with a fuel leak, retiring. So taking a look at the points, Jack Brabham able to extend his lead now. 24 points over 18 from John Surtees. John Surtees only able to pick up three points in his first run for Cooper. Lorenzo Bandini cements himself into third position with a pair of third place finishes now. Two podiums for Bandini, not too bad, but eight points there in third place. Ahead of myself, Richie Axelson, six points now with the two points here from France. Making the best out of a bad situation, I guess, but two points itself not going to set the world on fire. I'm actually tied now with Mike Parks, who made his first start in this race. So then for the Manufacturers Championship, of course, Brabham Repco out front, 24 points, but just ahead of Ferrari with 21 points. The six points that Parks picked up helping out there quite a bit. You can see how tight that makes the championship there. Cooper Maserati filling up that third position, and then the two points I just pulled up for BRM, tying them with Brabham Climax for the four points I picked up at Monaco. Remember, for both the Drivers' and Manufacturers' Championship, only the best five rounds count towards the championship. So even though we're three rounds in, we do have six rounds remaining. So all of these races so far could technically be drop races. So we won't really know how things shake out until we get late into the season, but it's all about just getting consistent results. And today was not the best race that I could have run. So you win some and then you lose some. It's been a bit of a rut for Richie here, despite the good performance at Le Mans. But next up, the Formula One Circus heads back to the UK for the British Grand Prix this year held at Brands Hatch. So until then, thank you for watching. Hope it was enjoyable. This is GP Laps, and I'll see you all again next time.